God is faithful. Do you need to be reminded of that today? Well, if so, stay with us for Dr. McGee's heartfelt study in Revelation 14, verses 1 to 4. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and I'm so glad you're aboard the Bible bus with us. Before we get started in our study, though, here's a brief introduction for today's program from Dr. McGee. We have come through chapters 12 and 13, which, without any shadow of a doubt, bring the world to the darkest period in its history. And actually, the world goes through that period that the Lord Jesus labeled the Great Tribulation Period. Well, at the beginning of the period, the Lord Jesus sealed 144,000. And the question is going to arise, how many of them made it? through the Great Tribulation period. And that, of course, is something that would engage the attention of all of us. Could they make it through? Well, we're going to see the Lamb on Mount Zion, and you know how many he has with him? 144,000. Not 143,999. Not one of those little sheep got lost. He came through with all of them. And if they all made it through that number, I want to say that I come back to his parable that the Lord Jesus gave of the shepherd that had a hundred sheep and one little sheep got, you know, off and lost. And he went after it because when this shepherd starts out with a hundred sheep or a hundred and forty four thousand sheep, he always comes through with a hundred sheep and 144,000 sheep. And I can be thankful for a salvation that is sure. Not because I'm sure, but because he is sure. And it's not because I do not have times of fear and dread, because I do. But like the little Scottish lady, she says, I tremble on the rock, but the rock never trembles under me. And so we can say today that if we are on the rock, Christ Jesus, we have something to be thankful for today. That's great news. God is faithful. We can trust him. If you've not placed your hope and trust in God, then I invite you, I plead with you to humble yourself before him today. Whether it's the first time to trust him or maybe you're trusting him day by day, do it now. Now about our study today, Revelation has some very real and very direct warnings. Dr. McGee hasn't pulled any punches in telling you about God's judgment coming to this earth. But to those of us who trust in God, like we'll hear about the 144,000, He will save us. To find out more about God's great love for you and how He can save you, why don't you visit our website at ttb.org and click on the banner, How Can I Know God? If you're still not ready or willing, I'll let Dr. McGee give you some more convincing evidence today. And then I'll give you that web address again at the end of our study. Now, before we open God's Word together, let's share a few letters from our fellow Bible bus passengers who have accepted God's free gift and have chosen to follow Jesus. The first is from a listener of our Dakani program in India. He writes, I pull a rickshaw for a living and I love listening to music. I listen to the radio all day. Not too long ago, I came across through the Bible. While I was listening to it, I heard the message on Matthew 11, verse 28. At that time, I was addicted to alcohol and drugs. Then and there, I put my burdens in Christ's hands. After that, my life changed. Now I am staying with a pastor and undergoing Bible training. Because of my old habits and my newfound faith that is against our traditions, my family members are against me. I have a small piece of land, and I want to build a church on it but my family members are opposed. I'm going to wait and see what God does. Jesus has blessed me. The rickshaw I used to have was rented, but I saved my money, so now I have my own rickshaw. Here's another letter also from India, listening to our Chattisgari program. 
One of my friends introduced me to your radio program. The beautiful title song attracted me, and I was compelled to listen to the entire program. I couldn't believe it was in my own language. After one month, I chose to accept Jesus is the Son of God, and He died for my sins. So, I believe in Jesus Christ and am so grateful for your teachings. I'll say it again, God is faithful. So let's pray now as we study Revelation 14 together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you accept the sacrifice of your Son for the payment of our sins, and you now call us your children. We pray many more would come to experience your gift of salvation through what they hear in your word as it goes out all around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we've come to chapter 14, and the theme here is the Lamb on Mount Zion, the everlasting gospel preached in the world, and that Babylon will fall, and judgment and blessing is announced, and the coming of Armageddon also. So you see, this is a chapter that contains many things, and we'll be looking at that. Now, this chapter constitutes a hiatus in the series of the seven performers that concluded last time. Now, it's obvious that this interlude could not be fitted in between the sixth and seventh performers who are the two wild beasts. First, the wild beast out of the sea, the wild beast then out of the earth. They had to be considered together. They're just like Siamese twins. And the continuity between them could not be broken. Therefore, this interlude follows the seventh performer in recognition of the logical sequence of this book, which is not a hodgepodge of visions, but it unfolds in a logical, chronological, and mathematical order. Now, there are certain performers here that are called to our attention in this chapter, to give us a full-orb view of the spectacular events of the two previous chapters. In other words, there are other performers besides the seven that are mentioned. And it's clear from chapter 13, and we mentioned it then, that that's the darkest day and the most horrible hour in history. It's truly hell's holiday. And every thoughtful mind must inevitably ask the question, he can't avoid it, how did God's people fare during this period? Could they make it through to the end with overwhelming odds against them? Well, the shepherd who began with 144,000 sheep is now identified with them as the lamb. And do you know how many he has with him? Well, he doesn't have 140. 3,999 sheep. He has 144,000 sheep. He did not lose one, for he redeemed them, and he sealed them, and he kept them, for he is the great shepherd of the sheep. And these sheep are of another flock that are not of this fold. That is the fold we're in today. He got these sheep through all right. And that's a picture that's before us now as we open this chapter. And he's going to have the last word, not the two beasts. The Lord Jesus will, the lamb. And this is not the lamb that speaks like a dragon. This is the Lord Jesus himself. And since he's going to have the last word, Babylon will fall. That will be the great political capital, the great commercial capital, and the great religious capital of the world during the Great Tribulation. It'll fall, and the followers of the beast will be judged. Many of his own became martyrs, but they didn't lose. They won. Again, I say with Calvin, I'd rather be on the side. It seems to be losing today, but it's going to win finally than to be on the side that seems to be winning today, but it's going to lose eternally. I'm glad I'm on the winning side. Now, we are told them that they're martyrs and their works fall after them. He's going to reward them. And the Lamb's returning to the earth. We're going to see that when we get to the 19th chapter. And the morning is coming. The darkness will fade away. And the Son of Righteousness will arise 
with healing in his wings. Now, we have here, first of all, the picture of the lamb with 144,000, and that's presented to us in the first five verses. Now, let me read. And I saw and behold the lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Now, John says, and I saw. Now, that indicates that John is still the spectator to these events. And the reel here continues to roll, and the story continues to unfold. And the lamb here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have already seen that in the fifth chapter. I'll not go back there, but we saw it in verse 6. Verse 8, verse 12, verse 13, then in chapter 6 and verse 1, chapter 13. We see now the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb. And then something that we ought to make very clear, Mount Zion here is at Jerusalem. No use trying now to locate this any other place except where it is, and that's Jerusalem. And what we have here is a picture of a placid and pastoral scene, and this is what opens the millennial kingdom here upon this earth. And the Lord Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem. He called it the city of the great king. And then in Psalm 2.6, if you have any doubt about Mount Zion, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, it's the Lord's intention who put the Lord Jesus on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and specifically Mount Zion. Now, the 144,000 we believe here to be the ones that were sealed back in chapter 7. Now, I recognize there are some problems that are connected with this view, but they came through the Great Tribulation, like the three Hebrew children came through the fiery furnace, And notice that the Lamb is standing with them on Mount Zion. Although he is in his person the Lamb, he is also the shepherd. He started out with 144,000, and he came through the Great Tribulation, not with 143,999, but 144,000. He has all of them. He didn't lose a one. And in this hour, in our day, when the pressures of Satan bear us down, the living, victorious Christ is available to us. Oh, that you and I might come to know him better, that we might draw closer to him, and that he might be more meaningful to us, and that he might occupy a greater place in our lives day by day. I'm convinced in my own experience that The Lord Jesus Christ in person is the answer. It's so easy to say Jesus is the answer. And when I see that, I always say, well, what's the question? Well, he is the answer to all of these problems that men are running around today trying to work out some little method or some little system, and that if you do it, why you can solve the problems of your life, your home, your work, your church, and all that sort of thing. And if there ever was a day in which there was so much teaching in all of these areas, and there's less living of these things out in the lives of believers, in the homes of believers, in the business of believers, in the community where the believer lives, what is the real problem today? It's not that we need a method. We don't need a method. We need Christ. We need to know him more. We need to draw closer to him. He needs to be more meaningful to us. Have you talked to him today yet, friends? And by the way, when was the last time you told him that you loved him? Well, he's said he loves you, and we ought to say that back to him. Now, I'm going to read verses 2 and 3 here. And as usual, I'm reading in my translation. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And the voice which I heard was as the voice 
of harpers harping with their harps, and they sing, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no man could learn the song save the hundred and forty and four thousand, even they that had been purchased out of the earth. Now, John begins by saying here, and I heard. John's a spectator, but he's also an auditor to this scene here. Now, the 144,000 join the heavenly chorus in the millennium. And have you ever heard a choir of 144,000? Well, up to this time, earth has been out of tune with heaven. But here, the rule of Satan is over, and heaven and earth are in tune. And what Browning said is true when you get to the millennium. God is in his heaven, and all's right with the world. But boy, all things are wrong with the world right now. Now, the 144,000 here learn this new song, and they join in the harmony of heaven. God has put his harpers in heaven, while the 144,000 on earth on Mount Zion. That's a long ways from the instruments, by the way. And these harpers here, now I've been a pastor for many, many years, and I can say that I've met a lot of harpers down here. They're always harping on something, and they're harping about this. But these are different kind of harpers. They are really going to make music. Ones I've listened to didn't make very good music. Now we're told that they are purchased out of the earth. It means that they've been purchased to enter the millennium on earth, not taken to heaven. They've been purchased out of the earth. They've been purchased, which means to live on the earth because the unsaved are not going to live on the earth. And no one can sing this song but the redeemed. No one can sing praises unto God but the redeemed. Again, I wish that that could be gotten over to a great many song leaders today. Now, I can see their problem. They want to get everybody to sing. And they say, now, nah, look, I see everybody's not singing. Now we want everybody to sing this song. Well, friends, if you've got a mixed audience, that is, of saved and unsaved people, don't ask the unsaved to sing a song of redemption. Don't ask them to sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. Why, if an unsaved person sings that, you're making a liar out of them. Don't ask them to sing it. Just let the redeemed sing it. In fact, the psalmist says, the Lord is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And friends, who else can say so? Nobody else is going to say so, only the redeemed. And that's the reason that we need to say so Christianity today, to say that God is good. That's something that we need to emphasize today. Now, heaven and earth are brought here in marvelous harmony during the millennium. And what a contrast it was to chapter 13, where earth is in rebellion against heaven under the beast. Here all is tranquility under the Lamb. Now let me move on down and read to you verses 4 and 5, and I'm going to read in my translation here. These are they that were not defiled or besmirched with women, for they are virgins. These are they that Follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were purchased from among men to be the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no lie. They are without blemish. Now they were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, what does that mean? That has always been a puzzle to me. I'll be very frank with you. Now, it can have a literal or a spiritual sense, or both. And I personally think that probably both are here. Uh, I think John would have indicated which one he was emphasizing. Now, the period of the Great Tribulation is one of unparalleled suffering. And the 144,000 have been through that period. And the abnormal times demanded an abnormal state. And that was the reason. I can recall in 
World War I as a boy, that many a young fellow went to war and he was engaged to a girl and he never came home. And sometime they got married right before he left and he had a child that he never saw because he never came home. Well, that was war times. And I've heard, well, I had one woman say, I wish I had never gotten married. Well, that's her viewpoint. Well, certainly during this period, it's going to be so terrible that they'll not get married. Now, Jeremiah lived at a critical time also, at the time of the Babylonian captivity. And God forbade him to marry because of the dark days. Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah the 16th chapter. Will you listen to this? Beginning with verse 1. The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. For thus said the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented. Neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of earth. Now, our Lord pronounced a woe, you'll recall, upon those who were with child during the great tribulation. In Matthew 24, 19, he said, Woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Now, you and I are living in a day when we're told, Paul says that marriage is honorable, the bed under fire. In 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about this a great deal. And God's injunction to know after the flood, not before, was to multiply and replenish the earth. And that is not the scripture to apply to a world today that's faced with a population explosion and at a time when believers can see the approach of the end of the age. During the Great Tribulation, there will be an exaggerated emphasis upon sex, and obviously, immorality will prevail. And it will not be a good thing to marry during the Great Tribulation. Now, the 144,000 will have kept themselves aloof from the sins of the great tribulation period. And considering adultery now in a spiritual sense, and I'd like to mention that also, idolatry was classified as spiritual fornication in the Old Testament. The classic example is Ezekiel 16. And there you find God's severe indictment against Israel for fornication and adultery, which was idolatry. Now, the 144,000 have kept themselves from the worship of the beast and his image during the great tribulation. So you see that when it says here, these are they that were not defiled with women, for they are virgins, it apparently means that they kept themselves from the immorality of the great tribulation period, although they had not married because of the extreme and severe times into which their lot was cast, and they did not marry it, but they didn't yield to that immorality of this period. And also, and I think that both things are true, that fornication, adultery is labeled that in the Old Testament, but it means idolatry. It means worshiping idols. And so we have here both in view. We have, I think, the literal sense and the spiritual sense. And I think both of them make good sense, by the way. Now, we've come as far as we can today, but you mark that place because we're going to begin right there next time. And until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Yes, mark your place at verse 5 and also take some time today to read the rest of Revelation chapter 14 as we prepare for tomorrow's study. To listen to this message again or share it with a friend, it's available at ttb.org for free. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the most important decision that you'll ever make is the decision to accept God's free gift of salvation, His amazing offer of eternal life. 
So if you haven't already done so, why don't you visit our website at ttb.org and click on the banner, How Can I Know God? There you can read and listen to some of Dr. McGee's resources at your convenience. Or if you'd prefer to receive a few by mail, you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. That's 1-800-652-4253. Or write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Our important study of Revelation continues tomorrow right here on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwartz, praying that the grace of the Lord Jesus would be with you as you walk with Him today. Jesus made it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, be washed in white as snow. Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.